Pedophiles are detested by everyone in society, including the police. But what happens when those policemen realize that their colleagues are actually pedophiles? I use toys. No, my name is not Paul. What, whatever you're doing, it's a bad idea. Here are three instances when cops found out their colleagues were pedophiles. Starting with Ralph Shorty, who at that time was an Oklahoma senator. On March 9th, 2019, police officers received a report that a man had taken a juvenile with him into a motel room. So the cops arrived at the scene and headed for the hotel door while silently pleading that the report was false. Hey, you know, it's more police department, man. We just need to check on your welfare, make sure you're okay. After several knocks, the door was opened up and the juvenile stepped out of the room, leaving the officers laser focused on the man. I'm right here, I'm right here. Hey, hey. Come out yeah, before you get me worried. I'm, I'm Show me your hands. Okay. Take a seat on the... Sit down right here. What's, what's going on? What's going on with you, man? I'm just I'm trying to have a good time. A good time? Yeah. What's your name? Ralph. Ralph what? Ralph was ushered back into the room, and while the officers looked around, one officer assumed that Ralph didn't fully understand the situation he was in. I'm sorry, guys. You're kind of freaking out a little bit. Yeah, that's what we do. He's 17. What do you mean, okay? Okay. But you got a 17-year-old hanging out with you. Ralph had taken a 17-year-old male into his hotel room at 3 a.m., and was now heads down as the cops further explained his situation. I'm telling you he's 17. Like, I wouldn't lie to you. Like, uh, what, what sense What sense does it make me lie to? But listen, what, whatever you're doing, it's a bad idea. The officers wanted no explanation from Ralph and concluded that they had all they needed to know, but they couldn't have been more wrong, especially considering they didn't even know the true identity of the man they were lecturing. A few days after the incident, Ralph was invited for questioning and the interaction unexpectedly opened up multiple closets in the case. Well, how did y'all meet? At the coffee shop. I'm, I'm pretty sure of, of that. Um, but what coffee shop are you That's my guy on the coffee shop. Oh, on, it's called Holy Grounds Coffee. Okay. And um, the night that uh, he called me, um, he said he just needed to get out of his house. Um, I'm assuming I have, I mean, I thought he had told me that he lived with some friends. And um, he had told me in the past that, you know, it was hard for him to get clean because he was always with his friends that, that uh, you know, living with them. Ralph mentioned that he met the teenager in his coffee shop a year ago and they became friends. He also stated that on the night of the incident, he decided to house the teenager in the motel after the teenager informed him that his roommates were drug junkies and he was trying to get clean. Ralph also claimed that he and the teenager usually communicated through phone calls, but he soon realized that the cops had a different story of their own. You said you come to your house several times to play video games? I think just once. Come to your house once to play video games? Uh, and then you guys met at the coffee shop a couple of times? Mm -hmm. Okay. What if I said that he told you you guys met through a Craigslist ad the very first time yeah. that he posted in Casual Encounters? No. Okay. Ralph's response to that question was a clear sign that he wasn't expecting them to have that information, and it sent him into a great shock. How old is your youngest child? Uh, five months. Okay. So he's telling me that when he first met you through Craigslist, that you that he had posted an ad in Casual Encounters, and that he had a lot of responses for it, but that you said that you wanted him to mess around with your wife while you watched. He said that he showed up to do that, or you guys got together and started talking about that. He found out your wife was pregnant, and then said that it never happened because she was pregnant. The juvenile posted a casual encounter ad on Craigslist when he was 16, and Ralph responded saying he wanted the teen to mess around with his wife while he watched. But that never happened because Ralph's wife got pregnant shortly after. And this story seemed to add up because the teenager was 17 now and Ralph had a five-month-old child. Ralph denied this being true, as expected, but the detectives were just getting started. He has a conversation that he says he had, that he had with you using an app called Kick. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> he, there's a pretty lengthy conversation on his tablet that uh, he says is with a guy that is you, that he, um, <clears throat> that is the online or the kick kick ID is Jamie Tilly, um, and you told officers that night that 
that to what what's your own line? He, he calls me Jamie, uh -huh. and I'm not sure why. Okay. The cops explained to Ralph that they had chats between the teenager and a man with username Jamie Tilly. And although Ralph disclosed that the teenager had called him Jamie, it wasn't enough proof that Jamie Tilly was Ralph. But the cops came well prepared and were one step ahead. So we, we've got a conversation between him and this Jamie Tilly about, um, he says, I need money for spring break. Uh, Jamie Tilly says, I don't know. Uh, really have any legitimate things I need help with right now, would you be interested in sexual stuff? He says, yes. This goes on about how I come get you, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> he says, okay, I'll be down the street, a couple houses in about 10 minutes or so. He says, okay, um, so I have, so I have, let me know so I have an idea. And then that person says, I-35 about to exit in four, at 4th four Street. And then it says, I'm here. Well, um, We've got a witness, <coughs> pardon me, we've got a witness that sees him get in a white Grand Cherokee and they follow that white Grand Cherokee to the hotel, Super Royal First Street, Fourth and Eastern. Before entering Ralph's white Cherokee, the teenager was confronted by a female friend whom he refused to tell where he was going. So when the teenager got into Ralph's car, the female friend, now a witness, followed them to the motel until they got into their room and then called the teenager's dad who in turn called the police. At this point, the cops had all the evidence they needed to put Ralph away, but they wanted one more thing from him, a confession. I don't want to be here not giving you an opportunity to, to set, the straight, set, set it straight and tell the truth. That doesn't sound like anything I say is gonna help. Mm, okay. Prosecutors disclosed that Ralph had sex twice with a teenager before the night of the incident, Ralph blamed the teenager for trying to ruin his life, and that held no water because the teenager had no idea that Ralph was a senator. But to no one's surprise, Ralph resigned from his seat 13 days after the incident. On September 18, 2017, Ralph was sentenced to 15 years in prison and 10 years of supervised release. And although Ralph's case was terrible, this next case involved a deputy sheriff who desperately needed a lawyer. Can I ask his is something I might, I should have lawyers on. In April 2020, police received an anonymous tip that an officer, Jalen Devon, had engaged sexually with a minor. Jalen, unaware of the report, arrived at the county sheriff's jail where he worked and was invited to the interrogation room where he would discover the unfortunate reality that awaited him. We're actually um, doing an investigation on some allegations that we have to obviously look into. You're a law enforcement yeah. officer, so you know that we look into everything. After reading him his rights, the detective began questioning Jalen on his personal life to build rapport and make him feel at ease and unthreatened. Cool. Um, and I hear your schedule recently changed. How do you feel about oh, the schedule change? Yeah. Seven, twelve and a half in a row. Kills you. Seven off is nice, but it flies by. So Jalen somehow divulged personal information to the detectives, probably with the thought that they were insignificant and unimportant to the case with the minor. But he would soon realize that they would become a huge asset later on in the interrogation. And I know when it comes to um, Facebook, you connect it to an email address. And then your Instagram account, what, same email? I think, I think so, yeah. Okay. And I know sometimes with Snapchat, they'll have you either sign up with a phone number or an email. I believe it's my phone number. With seemingly innocent motives, the detectives now had Jalen's email address and phone number. But while he answered all questions, his arms were crossed and he was swaying in his chair, clear signs that he was nervous. And that made sense because Jalen was a police officer. So he knew if he was in the interrogation room and wasn't the one asking questions, he was in for something big. Can I ask what this is about? Yeah, so we're looking into some allegations that were made. We're kind of, it, it started with a Crime Stopper report, so we're just kind of okay. going from there. Um, uh, we did receive um, a picture um, that, um, you know, when we looked into it, it looks similar to you. So I don't know yeah. if you can take a look at the picture and just tell me if you've seen this picture. Oops. So this picture right here. Yeah, that's definitely me. I'm the gross one. Okay, so um, this picture right here, how old were you when it was taken? 20. Have you ever used this picture on any social media site? Um, 
I think it was Snapchat back in the day, yeah. Okay. All right. Have you ever shared this picture with anybody on Snapchat? Um, yeah, probably my wife, to be honest. Um, I mean, obviously I talked to other girls back in the day too, but I can't remember. Right okay. Off the, head. the detective showed Jalen a picture of him connected to the reports, and he denied sending them to anyone else other than his wife and some girls on Snapchat a long time ago. While answering the questions, Jalen kept his eyes down and avoided the detective's gaze. And that wasn't going to go unnoticed. Photo came up in connection with some allegations um, about you communicating with a younger female on Snapchat. Okay. Have you ever communicated with any females that uh, we have already recognized that yes you have with yeah, your recruit so. from the from the um, the back uh, from the past? Is there anyone else you've communicated with on Snapchat? I mean, back then, no, just close friends and coworkers and stuff like that. Anyone recently? This was Jalen's fifth year as a police officer, and he had been trained for a half a decade in the art of remaining calm and even concealing his emotions when necessary. The one word reply, closed body language, and evasion of eye contact all rang alarms to the detectives that there was something he didn't want them to know. But he quickly realized that they knew a lot more than he thought. Well, along with the photo came some additional information about your personal life. Okay. Um, and based on some of the information you share with me today, it seems to add up. Okay. Um, so is there any reason why the person would say they're you, they're you and share your information? It sounds like it'd be someone that knows me then, obviously. Uh, I don't know who, I don't have any enemies that would be doing something like that. While interrogating suspects, detectives have the permission to lie about having evidence that convicts the suspect so that the suspects feel helpless and come clean. Being a cop, Jalen knew this all too well and decided not to call their bluff, but to double down and claim it was an enemy who shared his info. The only way he'd know the detective wasn't bluffing was if she somehow knew the exact details that he shared with the minor. Can I ask what information was shared? What they, what they know? Um, well, um, we know that you're a baseball player. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people know that. Yeah, so, so that information was kind of shared. Okay. Um, your work schedule? It's been five years that I've worked here. Specifically the transition to seven days on, seven days off. Really? I, I haven't shared anything like that recently. I couldn't tell you who that would be. Stiff-bodied, breathing into his chest and arms, wrapped around himself for comfort, Jalen realized he mistook the detective's friendly personality for ignorance and it was clear now that things were only going to get worse. So, I know as an athlete, um, you know, sometimes when I would do my usernames and stuff, I would kind of use a combination of my things that I know about myself, right? So that way I wouldn't forget it. So this particular picture came from an account with this username, right? J178211. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I recognize that your jersey name in college was, or was 17. Yes, it was. And then high school was 82. Football. And it was 11. In 2011. I never had 11. No, as far as you graduated in 2011. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it goes by J. And it is a Snapchat account that has some links to you. Okay. Okay. J, I'll be very honest. I just, I want to know the truth. Yeah, no, I never even heard of that account. Okay. The Snapchat account that shared Jalen's picture and personal details with the minor was J178211, the combination of his name, 17 being his baseball jersey number in college, 82 his jersey number in high school, and 11 stands for his graduation year of 2011. On top of that, it was linked to Jalen's email address and phone number. After several questions, Jalen asked for a lawyer although regrettably a little too late. The case involved four victims between the ages of 12 and 14, with prosecutors contending that there were more than 41 victims who couldn't be tracked down to verify their ages. Jalen pleaded guilty to 18 felony and two misdemeanor charges and was sentenced to 12 years in state prison. 
While Jalen eventually pleaded guilty to his crimes, the next cop's denial was on an entirely different level. Listen, I'm out here. I don't want you right here to do. I'm not here to do nothing. On August 15th, 2020, two men had agreed to meet up at a store after talks on a dating platform. But upon making contact, they weren't so happy to meet each other. Hey, what's going on? What are you here for? How you doing? What's your name? Paul. Paul? Yeah. What are you right here for? What's that? What are you right here for, Paul? Me? Yeah. I'm here to meet some of my friends. It's here to meet. Here to meet your friends? The man in the car identified himself as Paul, and he acted quite strangely for someone approached by a person he had planned on meeting. But that was because the person with the camera wasn't the person he thought he'd meet there, and he was in for something big. I'm here to get some tur I'm here to get a turkey and iced tea. Some cash, why? Oh, no, no, keep your hands while I can see him. Uh, who are you? 20 seconds into the strange interaction, and Paul's story had changed from meeting friends to getting iced tea. The man with the camera wasn't in a police uniform, but Paul put his hands up anyway. Obvious signs that he was nervous and had been caught doing something he wasn't supposed to. I'm out here. I don't know what you're right here to do. I'm not here to do nothing. Listen, I'm here to get a turkey hill ice. You hit up one of my decoys already. No. The man with the camera, Musa Harris, had logged into an online dating platform and appeared as a 15-year-old boy only to be messaged by Paul that night to meet up at the store for some type of sexual pleasure. So Paul arrived at the store hoping to find a teenage boy, but instead he was stared in the face by a predator catcher. That's the wrong guy. Buddy, Paul? No, my name is not Paul. You just say Paul. No. You just say your name Paul. My name's not Paul. You got the wrong guy, buddy. The man had faked his online persona so well that it was the first answer his brain could think of in this hostile situation. But when he realized the extent of the situation, he tried so hard to dissociate himself from the persona that his brain entered a flight mode. What's good, man? What's up? What's up? There's another one right here. You're not playing no, playing no homie game with me. You're not playing no game Got one again right here. You're not playing no game with me. Your way ass out of here. The predator catcher had struck again, but at the time, he didn't know exactly what he had caught. The man he caught was ex-police officer, Leonard Galley, who was terminated three years before this incident for breaking office protocol. Galley was sentenced to one to two years in prison and five years of probation. He was ordered to undergo sex therapy and is now registered as a tier three sex offender.